All right, Rep, and the floor is yours. We're live. Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I am Natalie Figueroa, representative in New Mexico House District 30. And I am also a 31 year teacher of high school Spanish. So I am excited to be with you this afternoon talking about a crucial issue that is dear and the focus of my professional life. We have tremendous panelists with us this afternoon. And I think uh, we can all agree right off the top that every child, regardless of their zip code, deserves a high quality education. But when it comes to guaranteeing that education for all of our students in New Mexico, we have faced tremendous challenges. And that was even before the pandemic. So joining me to speak to some of those challenges this afternoon are incredible education experts whose experience and commitment and vision are helping forge the path forward for our students. So these panelists are going to share this afternoon their perspectives on what the legislative priorities should be as we move forward to provide that high quality education to all of our students. For all of you out there who are joining us via Facebook Live and via Zoom, welcome and know that you have a question feature. You can type questions at any point during the presentation. We'll pull them up and we will be answering questions during the second half of the town hall. So, who do we have with us this afternoon? We have joining us the Secretary of New Mexico's Public Education Department, Secretary Ryan Stewart. Also joining us, we have board member Barbara Peterson from the Albuquerque Public Schools School Board. There's Barbara. And our final panelist is Karen Bobra, founding principal of the Native American Community Academy. There you go. I'm going to address some questions to each of the panelists in turn. And I would like to start, if that's all right, with Secretary Stewart. Secretary, let's start with what parents need to know as they are negotiating this semester of education in New Mexico, and what they need to know about potential school reopenings, um, the various models underway, and the supports available to them. Thank you, Representative, and, and thank you both for uh, making it available for us to have this town hall forum to be able to come and address issues in education. Uh, and more importantly, thank you for your, your ongoing service to the students of New Mexico uh, and the amazing work that you do day in, day out as, as a leader in the classroom. Um, so I'll start off to, to, as a, to kind of frame where we are. Um, uh, for those of you who, who have been following or if you haven't been following, um, we, we have outlined the criteria for uh, re-entry into the school building, and we're taking a very deliberate approach to doing it. Um, we've seen across the country that um, many, many states, many districts have uh, rushed back in to school, brought everybody back without a lot of the safety protocols in place, and uh, immediately had major outbreaks of cases that spread throughout communities and had to shut schools down. Uh, and, and we're trying very hard to avoid those kinds of systemic outbreaks and learn from what we've seen across the country and really let science be our guide. Because our goal is first and foremost, making sure we're protecting the safety of our students and our staff members and their families when, we, when uh, schools come back in. And then as we put all the safety protocols in place, maximizing the amount of safe in-person learning that we're able to offer. And so we, we when we get kids back into the buildings, we wanna keep them there and we wanna keep them there safely uh, and continue to move forward and continue to build the confidence of our community members, of our families and of our students and our educators that they're all cared for, that we're able to do um, the work that we need to do in, in a safe uh, and responsible manner uh, and do 
uh, I know that the pandemic has really thrown us all for uh, 15 different loops. But um, as we're as we're navigating through this and learning how we live and cope with the virus in our presence, uh, that that we're doing so in a way where we're still able to um, uh, provide a, a strong academic program for, for our kids. We learned a lot from having to immediately make this shift in the spring. Um, districts and schools had to turn on a dime and uh, all of a sudden take on new models that they, that they had never before intended. Um, we, we're taking the lessons learned from that and really, uh, again, trying to, to uh, on the academic side, provide clear guidance uh, across the state around um, how we can uh, build off of what we did in the spring and have an even better fall semester. Uh, we know that there are still challenges out there. We know that there's still gaps, especially around technology access. So we're trying to work very diligently with our internet service providers around that. Um, but I think uh, to get back to your question, Representative, on uh, what is it that we really want parents to know about coming back um, as a state, we and as uh, district leaders and charter school leaders, Everyone has really pulled out all the stops to try to make sure that we have a safe environment for those students who choose to come back. And for those students who are choosing to stay remote even beyond the time when their schools reopen for, for various reasons, whether they be medical or, or family reasons, um, that we're bolstering the online options that we have. And teachers in this, in this environment and our food service workers and our custodians and our bus drivers, um, really please uh, reach out, thank them, thank your principals, thank your superintendents, thank your school board members. This is a really, really hard time. And education is the most complex part of reopening uh, the state. And, um, and, and your, your educators are, are doing it. They're in the classrooms, they're in the, in the food service lines, they're cleaning the hallways, they're, they're, everyone's really pitching in to, to make this work. Um, and so, uh, so please do make sure that you're, you're reaching out and thanking them. Thank you, Secretary, for giving us that overview of what's going on across the state. And I absolutely agree. There are so many folks coming together in every school building across this state to make sure we are providing education to our students. Even if it's remote, we're working sure, we're making sure that the buildings are functioning and that staff is there and providing meals to students. I'd like to narrow the focus a little bit and ask board member Barbara Peterson some questions about Albuquerque. Specifically, Albuquerque Public Schools is one of the largest school districts in the country. Um, what are the challenges we are facing here in our school district right now? And how, how is the district supporting families and students so that they can be successful? So I think I've never had as difficult a decision as we've had over the last couple of months of really trying to decide how to move forward safely. Um, just thank you very much representative for having this town hall and for inviting me I really appreciate it and I want to really thank Secretary Stewart um, there's been a real effort I think between the district and the PED to solve problems and to make plans and we really appreciate the collaborative nature of this PED it's very much appreciated and it really is the way that we can move forward. And just one other little snippet, really have to thank the community for taking seriously things like mask wearing. Um, you know, our, our plan for re-entry has everything to do with keeping people safe. And we know that the way we do that is to lower the spread in the community. And I think Albuquerque especially, statewide and Albuquerque has stepped up and really worked at following the rules and thinking about what's scientifically sound. So hopefully we can start really moving forward thinking about how do we carry out our mission of educating children, but at the same time we have this new mission of really being compelled to keep everyone safe. Um, 
And it has to do with everything from just physical well-being. That's not just the COVID virus, but it's getting kids fed. So, I mean, I, I have never been as impressed with APS as I was back in March within a week of the shutdown. There were meals going out to families and finding ways, adjusting, figuring out how can we do that as we entered this and did that throughout the summer. When we started this school year, we had to figure out things like what, what criteria do we have to follow for reimbursement and all of those sticky things. So it was with huge relief that we got the word from the Federal Department of Agriculture that we can con continue the same policy of meals that we had during the summer. So no tickets, no verification of proving who you are or what school you're enrolled in. Um, we have almost every high school that's passing out a whole week's worth of food on Mondays, midday and then late afternoon. And then because that's really difficult, we have families that don't have refrigeration. We have families that don't have the ability to, to deal with that quantity of food. So now we have many schools that have um, grab and go three days a week. We're doing everything from um, switching out filters for ventilation to setting up hotspots and have partnered with the city. We've um, converted school buses to be able to park them in certain areas in the city where we know there's concentrations of students without sufficient broadband. Um, all of these things are helpful. And finally, um, I, have to, I have to give a real shout out. This is Community School Coordinator Appreciation Week and never have community school coordinators been as important to our schools. You know, we talk about zip code, every student can learn regardless of zip code. And that is definitely true in terms of what kids walk in the door with in terms of, you know, rich culture and experience and language. But there are also real barriers that we have to deal with. And that's one of the important things about the community schools. We can't ignore the fact that there are kids that come in, for instance, without dental care, without, without other kinds of wraparound service supports. So the community schools are critical in making a reality what we say about zip code not mattering, that we know equity means we have to look at some real different things to do to support families and students. Um, right now, we are working on bringing back in special ed students based on individual need and IEPs so that again, we can really keep kids safe, but begin addressing educational needs um, in ways that the remote learning doesn't facilitate. As time goes on, I think we are all in this continuous, continuous improvement mode, you know, to keep really examining what's working, what's not. And what I keep telling families is talk to teachers. Teachers are working so hard to make this work for students. And now more than ever, we just need to keep keep talking. We need the communication. What is working? What's not working? What do we need to fix? How can we start looking at meeting the needs of young children who we know don't benefit from on-screen time? Um, but at the same time, we have around 25% of our staff that's at risk, that we really have to protect. There aren't new teachers to come in. We have faced a teacher shortage for the last 10 years, really, and substitute shortages. So we have to protect our staff, but that doesn't mean that we're, we're not listening to the community too about how to meet those needs. Um, just, do you want me to go into our wish list or do you want me to hold off on that? 
Well, thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I think let's circle back to the wish list um, on the second round of questions okay. and focus. Think, be thinking about those legislative priorities, um, particularly since you mentioned community schools. Uh, what what will make our work effective with students? Okay, um, and right now I think let's go to Kara. Um, Kara, as Barbara pointed out, COVID has put a spotlight on the fact that the quality of education a student receives does sometimes depend on that zip code. So could you speak a little bit about your work in relation to educational disparities um, and what you see happening and you can start moving into the topic of what you think should be happening in terms of state legislation, legislative priorities to address some of these disparities because the benefit or the silver lining, I should say, there is no benefit, but the silver lining of this pandemic has been the conversations that are happening at every level of every education between families and schools, between schools and districts, districts in the state, between schools and unions, between schools and businesses. In every way, the whole state is pulling together to help make our students successful. And that gives us an opportunity to make change, not just to meet this crisis, but to change our educational system to shrink the educational achievement gap that has persisted in New Mexico for years. So please speak a little bit about your work. Thank you, I'm Representative Figueroa, and thank you, um, Ms. Peterson and Secretary Stewart for the work that you guys are leading and supporting with all of the educators across the state, as well as our students and families at this time. And you know, I think that that question is a really important question when we think about what is possible and what are the opportunities that, that lie ahead. I think about 10, 15 years ago, we really engaged in that question around what would we do if we wanted to serve Native American students and serve them in a way that was dramatically different, given a blank slate and also thinking about the opportunity to really create something new. And Representative Figueroa, I hear that something that you're you're sharing right now is that we do have that opportunity and it may be the silver lining that we can build from going forward. As people start to come together, I think that was definitely something that we've seen both in our Native American communities and uh, other areas across the state, um, working with both tribes, Native American organizations, as well as other advocacy organizations to think about what did students and families need alongside what they were getting from their school but also thinking about the agencies at the state level who'd come together, everything from Indian Affairs, the Department of Health, UIFT, the Public Education Department, Higher Education Department, and Early Child Care Department. Um, the liaisons in those spaces have just been like at, at um, on calls and listening to what's happening in communities on the ground and being able to respond to those communities in a way that's unique for each one. And I think about that in relation to students as well. Um, if we think about how do we start to listen to families, educators, um, a variety of stakeholders right now and what it is we want to see. We know that, you know, one of the questions that the school, um, you know, professional development team had to ask themselves is like, what can we do right now in a DL environment and what can't we do? And what's really, really core at the mission and vision of what it is we're trying to accomplish. And I think that question is one that we can all answer right now is like, if we want to prioritize the well-being of our students, educators and families, then that's something we really need to, I guess, um, rally around and also build our systems and outcomes towards. Um, I think the idea of community schools is something that resonates um, for many, many students, both in Native American communities and students that are being served in, in a variety of different ways. Also thinking about, you know, not only how we utilize our resources, but knowing that we need to really direct them in a way that makes sense. Um, as we started to come together to think about the mission of what Native students needed, it was really three things that came to the top. One, that students should have the opportunity to continue on to college and or career um, as they move forward and that their learning be centered on what their passions are and what that is that they want to see. Second is that they are secure in their identity and the identity stemming from language and culture, as well as the assets that they bring to the school environment. 
and having educators who are ready to respond to those students in, um, in a way that's strength-based, as well as being healthy and being holistically well, thinking about your social emotional development, your physical health and wellness, as well as your connection to your community and your intellectual, intellectual like um, curiosities. Um, we find that that works when we can blend all of those things together. And sometimes that's the school and sometimes it's a key partner. Sometimes it's an elder in our community that comes in to, to teach and be with our students. But just thinking more um, dramatically about what's the focus we wanna have, but also how do we relieve some of the constraints in order to, to achieve that. Um, and I think the idea around meals that, um, you know, President Peterson was sharing was one idea, like we know we need to get this to our students and communities, but we also know there's a lot of things that we can move out of the way to remove that obstacle. So what can we stop doing and what can we start doing? When I think about like, what can we focus on that is really, really essential, um, over and over again, we hear the commitment to language and culture being one that is really, really important and not losing sight of that um, throughout this time. I know that we have teachers, um, our principals and some of our curriculum leaders who are thinking about how do we continue to provide land-based learning as well as um, you know, indigenous education models even though we are in a distance learning mode? Um, and what is that gonna look like coming out on the other end? There's a, a many um, other you know, thought partners thinking about students as individuals and what they want to learn and then what are their learning needs? And could we use something like you know, a mentorship model on um, in the next like six to 18 months that really centers on students making decision-making rights around what it is they felt that they need to, to re-engage in in learning as we move forward. Is that a statewide effort, you know, marshalling some of our AmeriCorps um, VISTA programs and really, you know, directing them towards those efforts? Um, could it be something that is um, launching an Indigenous education transformation zone that really focuses on all aspects of Indigenous communities coming together around education and learning from kids from early learning to adulthood? Also thinking about things like the expansion of our, you know, state civil bilingualism and biliteracy and not losing sight of that either. So I feel like we're in a in a response mode right now, but we also have the opportunity to build something going forward. And this might be the time to think about how to do that um, coming together. I, I love the um, article I read this weekend, or the op-ed, um, that did call for students and families to start giving input to our policymakers about what are their immediate needs right now? And then what are they worried about? And what are they helpful for? I think those are all things that will start to, to generate a conversation. And that was something we found that was really great in the co-creation of our school. Um, which really drove everything we've done for the past decade. And many of our alumni, some who teach at our school now, and some that are in you know, law school, different places in their communities are thinking through these things together. And I think that that's something that I really look forward to, to participating in. And also something that I think that our leadership can, can, um, can rally around as we start to turn the corner here going into the fall. Thank you, Ms. Bobroff. Um, and I think you have alluded to something that we really don't want to lose sight of, that we are not just reacting to crisis, but we are having conversations that can transform, can change how we do things on into the future, because the world will be different into the future. And you alluded to leveraging the strengths that our students and their families and their communities bring to the educational process. I hope that continues to be part of that conversation. The conversation we are having today, listening to questions from the community and speaking to each other is part of the process that's going to help us move out the other side with a stronger educational system. So toward that end, I'd like to ask Secretary Stewart, if you see legislative priorities in the next session, um, particularly that will help us not lose ground, but actually move us forward in terms of some of the key issues that we as a state made a commitment to in the 2019 session, for example, a commitment to recruiting and retaining excellent teachers, a commitment to meeting the needs of our Native American students, our Hispanic students, our special education students, um, students who, other students who are at risk, 
Um, how do we move forward with those initiatives, expanding career and technical education? Um, how do we build on that momentum and keep that moving forward? Thank you, Representative. These are these are great questions, and the, and the questions as a as a department we are uh, constantly thinking about and strategizing around, and um, uh, we'll, we'll certainly be looking forward to the partnership through the legislative session to talk through those. Let let me talk about um, kind of I would say our our, our planning around some of the issues that you just mentioned, and then um, what I would say are kind of three things that are top of mind, certainly not the only things, but three things that are top of mind for the legislative session. Um, so last year, um, shortly after I came on, one of the first um, priorities I had along with the leadership team, including um, who was former Deputy Secretary Barbara, um, was really around um, uh, solidifying our, our key pillars for in our strategic plan is how we would focus our, our work. Um, and we really see the mission of the department um, around building the, the kind of culturally and linguistically responsive uh, educational system for all of our students that Dep Deputy Secretary, or I, I can't stop calling you Deputy Secretary, that Kara spoke of so well um, just a Sorry. second ago. Um, and, um, and so we see that as kind of the, the core principles and trying to organize all the work of the department around that. So you mentioned a couple of, of uh, items that kind of fall into some of those key pillars. So one of them being our educator ecosystem. We've made some investments in um, both the, the um, compensation side of, of the profession and also on, uh, I'll call it kind of professionalizing the profession um, uh, as we think about the, um, the work we're doing around uh, both um, evaluation and assessment and others. And I think key pieces of that include work that we're doing around teacher residencies, work that we're doing around growing your own teachers, work that we're doing around um, uh, putting in um, uh, better, stronger recruitment systems uh, so that we can both now and in the future, uh, make sure that we're re attracting the top talent and retaining them in, in New Mexico. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Kara talked about things like expanding our bilingual seal and creating stronger um, programs and support systems in our indigenous communities and and the work around creating that whole child system is a, a, a another big part. Um, community schools, as, as um, was mentioned earlier as well, um, that being a key part of the work we're doing to try to eliminate opportunity gaps. Um, so that all students can have the, the, the barriers that, that keep them from success eliminated um, so that they can really focus on academic success and, and schools can really be hubs of the community that really help bring people together, um, as well as our extended school year programs um, in the opportunity gap bucket. And then the pathways and profiles, when you mentioned things like CTE, um, we see that uh, we wanna increase the, the direct application and relevance of all of, the, all of the work that our students do so that they're prepared to take that applied learning both into the classroom, whether they go into second, uh, post-secondary or they go into career straight from high school, that they have really good options. And so working more closely with our Department of Workforce Solutions and our higher education department on creating expanded pathways in those areas. So all of those are legislative um, priorities that we talked about last year. We've convened um, a, a group that's helping us dive even deeper into some of those pillars and help better outline our, our goals and metrics and uh, one, two, three, and five year plans out for how we're achieving all of those um, and linking that directly to the student groups who are identified in Yazi Martinez and how is the, the work of the entire department organized to support um, those uh, student groups specifically. Three things I would say on the legislative, um, I, don't, I won't call them a wish list, but um, uh, that I think about when we come into the session. We've heard from many, many, many of our board members and superintendents about the impact that the pandemic is having on enrollment this year and the, um, the way in which it's really uh, an outlier um, from the way um, enrollment typically looks. And so that's going to have impacts on funding going forward because our funding system is based on prior year. Uh, and so, so one of the things um, that we're really looking at is what does it look like to, uh, first of all, what is the impact of that as we're seeing it play out? And then um, from a legislative standpoint, how do we make sure that the funding um, 
as students start to return kind of in mass, hopefully next year, uh, is still in place to, to, to welcome them back. Um, a second, we've seen technology be so critical during this pandemic uh, and the impact of either having or not having technology and having or not having um, the ability to connect to the internet and stay connected. Um, we think that we don't know what the course of the pandemic will be. Hopefully we're talking about many other things at this point next year. But I think the investment that we've made through CARES Act to get um, to close the digital divide is, as much as we can. Uh, we need to continue on that path and really make sure that that becomes a, a core part of our, of our work on an ongoing basis. Um, and the last thing I would just say is, this is the more overall general picture, uh, the legislature is going to have to make some incredibly, incredibly hard decisions about funding because of the way that this pandemic has really hit our economy so hard. Um, and so I certainly don't envy the position that, that you and your colleagues are going to be in to try to figure out how we manage through that. But I do, uh, I, I certainly will continue to advocate that as we, as we try to navigate this, that we, that we make education a priority um, as we're talking about some of the painful cuts that, uh, that will have to be made in the state budget. And I think that um, continuing to make progress on how we're funding education is gonna be critical to not, not backslide. Thank you, Secretary. And I think the digital divide that you mentioned is going to be a legislative issue, something that we do have to address for a variety of reasons, including educational. Beyond the pandemic, access to broadband um, is an educational resource. Uh, whether or not it is the only way your education is being provided, um, it is still an educational resource. And uh, that gap, again, has been illuminated and we have a responsibility to address it. Um, Ms. Peterson, from the APS perspective, would you like to talk about legislative priorities? I would love to, and I'm really excited to hear Secretary Stewart's report because it is very much in line with what we're asking for from the district. And it's so, it's really wonderful to be able to look at the legislative session and to know that we're going in with a lot of cooperation and very much in line with what we perceive as our needs. Um, hold, being held harmless for this year's enrollment versus what we expect and hope to have next year is really critical. And so just being aware of that, um, needing a state real investment in infrastructure for internet. You know, APS put in the um, fiber optic systems so that out to the East Mountains, to the West, I'm not sure if it got all the way to Tahajali or not. Tahajali is still a part of our district that we really recognize as having to put special attention at making sure it's possible for students to connect and those kinds of things. Um, so we've done some, some of that work already. I think to take some of the pressure off of the state, we have got to get the funding from the federal government as well, that the feds have to step up and play a role in meeting the broadband needs, the connectivity needs that we have. Just from a community point of view, we know that right now we already have about 5,000 students within APS that are homeless. Um, we also know that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of families that are gonna face eviction or lose their homes at the, at the end of the year if there's not an investment made from the federal level. And no matter how hard, when we are so dependent on oil and gas, until we really solve that long-term funding stream and what that looks like that's safe and healthy for New Mexico, we're gonna go through this year after year. And it's time that New Mexico be 
really get some dollars from from the feds that we need an investment nationwide in education you know i just the countries that have really successfully opened up and dealt with the infection are the countries that have invested for things like 12 to 15 students in a classroom every day consistently you know those are the kinds of things we need now clearly that's not automatically coming so there are some state level things that we need as well um you know we are looking at around a 40 million dollar deficit from what we projected initially and that is very troubling when we know that we've come out of already about 12 years of insufficient funding in crisis mode. So um, we are in a tough spot. We are in a tough spot, there's no doubt. And unfortunately, the departments that also need funding are also departments that support our community, whether it's CYFD, whether it's DOH, you know, we recognize that we are, we are in this together, that all of those funding streams need to come together to benefit our, our students. So we can't just look at one or the other, but um, that's, those are the huge parts of our wish list. I'm gonna throw in one more too that's, and I can't say I'm speaking for the entire board when I say this, but I, I think I'm speaking for at least a portion of us, maybe all of us, that there's a lot of almost hysteria around the COVID slide. And, you know, I, I think we really have to step back and examine what, what is that based on? That we have students right now that are in a particular place in history that they are learning in that there may be some textbook um, publishers and some standardized test publishers who look at this and see it as a time to amp up and sell their product. But I think it's on us to really help our community realize what, what are students learning at this point in time? And that we really step away from some of the hysteria and and really look at the kind of project-based learning that can happen when students are remote. How do we really set up curriculum that pulls on the strengths of families and community and what children know? How can we engage and really make inspiring and authentic the learning that's going on right now? And for sure, you know, we have a responsibility to continue working on the skills but I think there's a whole nother depth. I was talking to an art teacher who was talking about the kinds of rich experience from having kids at home who can go and talk to grandma and ask real specific questions, come back with artifacts, you know, quote unquote, classroom artifacts that are part of, part of the family, part of the community. And I think that it'll help everyone get through these bumps right now. You know, what is hard, realizing that there are some real strengths too that we can gain from this. So I don't wanna be completely, completely speaking from despair. Although I have, a, I have a certain steady, constant sense of despair <laughs> as well. Thank you, Ms. Peterson, for, for injecting that positive note, because we were speaking about leveraging the strengths that our students and their families and communities bring. And the working together is a core piece of how we are going to move forward. I hear both of you, secretary and board member, uh, about needing to address the infrastructure around broadband access and to address um, potential hold harmless legislation due to the drop in enrollment. Although I have some concerns and that was actually a question that is already lined up in our queue regarding uh, where those students might be. So um, 
I'm sure on the legislative agenda, we will be talking about holding harmless, the potential to hold harmless this year's attendance rate for funding purposes. But we are going to have to address where are those students and uh, what kind of education are they getting right now? And Ms. Bogroff, I don't want to skip your opportunity to speak to legislative priorities, but I also want to allow folks who are listening to ask questions. So go ahead and jump in with your legislative priorities, and then we will go to questions from our participants via Facebook and Zoom. Thank you, Representative. And I'll, I'll keep this short because I do want us to have opportunity to respond to the folks on Zoom and Facebook. Um, I think both what you know, uh, Ms. Peterson and um, Secretary Sud have shared are really resonate, and then also the um, need for broadband. I'm just working with some of our tribal communities to make sure that we have an open invitation to help co-create that starting today, knowing when the session you know comes along that we do have a plan going forward. And it's been um, great to see some of the things that folks have been able to contribute in that area. I think the other thing is on. Wow, the irony of talking um, about, about decision-making rights as they kind of come back in that. Uh-oh. We lost you for a second, yeah. but you are okay. back on. So go ahead. Okay, I would just say um, to really um, increase uh, the focus on family engagement to understand what parents and families have experienced and what their needs are now and in the future and their like goals for their own um, child. In addition to that, to um, think about how to redirect some of our existing funding to mentors and coaches that can be, um, I guess, deployed to work with students over the, the long term, knowing that you know, there are some things that students may want to ensure that they have covered that they may have not, they've missed out on, but also what their learning objectives are long term. So thinking about that strategically of the 330,000 some students we have in New Mexico, how can we get each one a mentor and a coach and or um, you know, work with their families to really craft a plan to, to respond to what they've experienced so far, both um, emotionally, socially, academically, um, as far as their own curiosity and life um, goals and going moving forward. I'll stop there and go to the questions. All right. Well, thank you very much and thank all three of you. And the questions that are coming in are not necessarily directed toward any one of you. So you are all invited to step in if you have a comment. But one of the first questions that popped up is, how do you anticipate that the COVID-19 pandemic will affect graduation rates in the state of New Mexico? Do you have any projections or thoughts on that? at this time. And I think that might be for you, Secretary. Yeah, so, so we'll actually have a lot more um, hard numbers for this in, in, the, in the coming weeks as we, uh, typically that's, uh, that tends to be around when we get the final uh, certified numbers about, about graduation rates. Um, it, it, it's a little bit hard to project um, at the moment. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't wanna speculate. I do think that, um, uh, we tried to issue guidance in the spring that really focused on um, making sure we were keeping kids on track to graduate. And we did um, spin up some partnerships to try to help with those kids who um, uh, may have uh, been disconnected from, uh, from their school for a variety of reasons, whether they were technological or, or they needed additional academic or counseling support. Um, so we know that we did connect with um, you know, hundreds of students that way but um, it's still a little bit early to tell exactly how the final numbers will shake out. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary. Um, I have another question here from Mel, who's actually asking what is our position on charter schools? And he did not specify. So Secretary, board member, Kara, you can all take a crack at this, but I'm, going to work on the assumption that it might be directed at me. Um, so I will, I will say that New Mexico has all our charter schools in New Mexico uh, are public schools. So as long as there is some accountability and some guidance, charter schools are designed to be sources of in innovation and schools where some unusual 
um, solutions, some unusual techniques and strategies might be tried, but the intent is if they prove successful to use them in the broader educational system. That was the origin of charter schools and that is their strength from my perspective. Um, as long as they are nonprofit and public institutions, charter schools can serve a great function in our educational system. Um, we have to make sure that there's accountability with funding, equity and funding, um, and, and use them for that purpose to generate ideas and strategies and techniques that are successful in local areas with groups of students. I mean, there, there's potential to do great things there. Um, would anyone else like to speak to charter schools briefly? If I can unmute, I'll jump in for just a minute. I mean, I, I think NACA is a perfect example of the things that we can learn with, with charter schools. But I think the challenge that we face then, because it's limited, and I think it has, I think charter schools have nationally for sure been part of an effort to privatize education, to suck off public dollars and, and pigeonhole in the South, definitely part of um, resegregation. If you nationally, by and large, charter schools tend to be much more segregated than here in New schools. Mexico. Here in New Mexico. Right. Here in New Mexico, there have been more safeguards to, to prevent that from happening. But it's still, I'll, I'll just speak from a real personal point of view. So Highland High School is an amazing high school. They have probably one of the most diverse communities anywhere in the state. They have a very large number of refugee students and are very serious about working to meet the needs of the students. Well, based on the past grading system for schools, what that does to Highland High School is make it look like it's an ineffective, quote unquote, bad school. Whereas in fact, it's just working to really meet the needs of students that may not fit the traditional profile of, you know, it's students with particular needs, whether it was being English language learners um, in particular. So what happens is that Highland becomes labeled as a failing school, which means that the diversity of the community starts changing and students leave. Student families are afraid that students will not get the education that a student deserves by going to Highland. So they start looking at charter schools, they start going other places. And the impact on Highland, for instance, has been that it becomes harder and harder to offer the number of electives that are needed. You know, it becomes harder and harder to have the CTE range. Um, it becomes harder and harder to make a go of some of the AP classes. So I think the challenge for a district like, like Albuquerque is to make sure, and this is part of equity, to make sure that no matter what school you are at, you have access to the choices. The choice shouldn't be put at the hands of a charter. Choice should be part of what's accessible to every student who walks in to a school like Highland. And, and so that is a real challenge. It becomes a funding challenge just based on size and student population and all of that. But we've got an obligation to make sure that we can offer those classes to students. But it gets harder and harder when, when the, when the community starts shifting and students start opting out of a particular school. Thank you, Ms. Peterson. 
All right, we have a couple more questions that we might, if we don't answer everyone's questions online this afternoon, I'm gonna make the commitment that I will answer, at least from my perspective, all of the questions that we don't get to discuss. Um, the next question that has come through the queue is, <laughs> When do you think New Mexico will allow for the use of 529 funds to be used for private high school tuitions? 529 funds are those funds, saving funds for education that folks use to put away money to pay for a child's college education is how they are used. And they're put away pre-tax. Um, and this again is not addressed toward anyone and I can address it loosely. Um, it is a cost to the state of New Mexico because of the funds are saved pre-tax. So tax is not paid on them. Um, and there's a loss of re revenue. And 529 funds were created and developed because there was a consensus in the state that the benefit of having college educated adults uh, the economic benefit outweighed to the state the use of tax dollars um, or the tax dollar revenue that is lost. And I do not foresee a time when New Mexico will make a decision, when the legislature will come to an agreement that a high school diploma has the economic benefit to balance the cost in public tax dollars. I just, I haven't heard any conversation that suggests the legislature is anywhere near agreeing to that kind of a change. If there's any disagreement out there amongst our panelists, feel free to weigh in if you're hearing different things. No, I, um, from, okay. from my perspective, I would, I would um, just, I would also echo that um, that's not been a, an issue that's been brought to the to the fore in, in uh, from my perspective either. And it hasn't been something that has been raised as a solution or a um, strategy in addressing some of the student populations that I was covering earlier. Um, so something that's not on, hasn't been raised in our community. Okay, thank you. All right, one more question, I think. Two more. Hmm. Okay, no one has mentioned to date, no one has used the term Martinez Yazi court decision. The Yazi Martinez court decision has not been mentioned, although it's been underlying all of our conversation today. For those who have been involved in the educational world, the, the changes and many of the movements um, made in 2019 that we are trying to keep moving forward has been inspired by that court decision. So um, how does that factor into your legislative and budget requests is this question. Um, and it makes reference to another representative, Representative Lente had several bills to address aspects of giving indigenous communities, Native American communities, better outcomes, including things like tribal libraries and as community hubs for robust broadband access and centers of curriculum that is culturally appropriate, culturally and linguistically serving those students and communities. Um, we haven't mentioned Yazi Martinez. How does that play into the legislative session that you foresee in January? I'm happy to start on this one. Um, I think with the, the Martinez Yazi decision, what, what we're looking to do as a department, as I mentioned earlier, is really organizing the entire work of the department to make sure that we are, uh, it, it's not just the, the uh, job of one individual or one division to, um, to address the student groups who are identified in Yazi Martinez, but that's, that's a core part of our work. It represents the vast majority of the students in the state. And, um, one of the things I would say about our budget requests is that we try to align our budget requests specifically with those key pillars. So uh, again, um, things like that Kara said around um, being able to invest in uh, more of our, our bilingual biliteracy programs, our indigenous language programs, um, the, the work that we're doing to try to recruit 
and retain more educators, particularly in, in our um, tribal communities. Um, and um, uh, the, the work that we do around trying to make uh, extended school year opportunities uh, available um, for, for, for more students across New Mexico, just being, being a few of those, uh, all of which are related to, um, to uh, addressing the, the needs of, of many of the student groups in, in Martinez Yazi. Uh, Carol led a lot of that work um, and helped organize a lot of the work when, when she was at the department and we continue on um, uh, diving deeper into that. Um, and that being said, I think it's, it's a huge challenge this year, given that we have such a huge hit to our budget. Um, uh, you know, we've been making significant continued investments in education. Um, uh, I hope that we continue to make those investments in, in education, but, but we do know that uh, there's some, some tough choices ahead uh, across all parts of the state. Uh, I'll again continue just to reiterate the kind of advocacy for uh, continuing to prioritize education when we have to make these, these painful decisions. But um, the, the work that we have to do, no matter what the, the budget situation is, um, remains. We have to deliver for um, the student groups who just have not been served uh, the way that they need to be served. So we, that, that's our ongoing focus. Thank you. I think we have circled back around to that fundamental belief that every child in the state of New Mexico deserves that high quality education. And we have here three experts working in this field to make it happen. I both as a teacher and a legislator am committed to ensuring that we achieve and exceed that goal for all of our children. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon and for being part of this conversation as we construct a, a successful path forward for our students through the pandemic and beyond with educational access, with equity and success for all of our students. Thank you very much.